Of the three tenor players that we're talking about, Coleman Hawkins, Ben Webster, and Lester Young, Lester arguably had the greatest impact overall on the history of jazz, despite a pretty tragic life. Lester's style was completely different than Hawkins. It was lighter and more melodic, as opposed to Hawkins, who tended to outline the chords in a hard-driving style. In Lester's own words, I don't like a whole lot of noise. It's got to be sweetness, you dig? Lester was one of those revolutionary and evolutionary musicians, like Louis Armstrong and Charlie Parker, who altered the musical trajectory. A whole school of saxophone playing developed in the model of Lester's style. Lester was born in August of 1909, six months to the day after Ben Webster, and he grew up in New Orleans. The family was poor but musical, and the young family band performed on the black vaudeville circuit. Lester started out on the drums, but he complained that all the girls had left by the time he finished packing up. So he switched to saxophone, and his brother Lee took over on the drums. Lester and Lee played together later in their careers. Lester didn't get along well with his father, who was a strict disciplinarian, and he left the family band to avoid touring in the segregated South. Lester's career really took shape when he moved to Kansas City to play with Walter Page and the Blue Devils, and then Benny Moten, and then Count Basie, with whom he ultimately came to fame. When Coleman Hawkins moved to Europe in 1934, Lester got the call to replace him in Fletcher Henderson's band. It wasn't a happy experience because his style didn't match the band's expectations. Fletcher's wife kept giving him records to listen to, hoping to make him sound more like Hawkins, but that wasn't going to happen. In the end, Lester traded gigs with Ben Webster, who was still in Kansas City playing with Andy Kirk. Returning to Kansas City reunited Lester with Basie. I've already told you the story about John Hammond recording the band in 1936 under a pseudonym Joan Smith Incorporated. Here's another cut. Shoeshine Boy from that historic session which introduced Lester and established him as a rising star. Lester developed a special relationship with singer Billie Holiday, who was five years younger and wound up leading a troubled life just as Lester did. You could call the relationship a musical romance, and Lester swore that that's all it was. 
Billy nicknamed Lester the president of the tenor sax, which got shortened to Prez. Lester called her Lady Day, a name that stuck, although Lester referred to everyone as Lady, man or woman. You can hear the affection in Lester's voice as an interviewer asks him about the relationship. When did you first meet Billy Holiday? When I came to New York in 1934. I used to live at a house with a mother, you know, because I didn't know my way around. She taught me a lot of things, you know, and got me little record dates, you know, play behind her little solos and things like that. Well, you're her favorite uh, soloist. Well, she is mine, too, <laughs> so that's a draw. I understand uh, she gave you a name, Prez, didn't she? Yeah, she did. And I gave her the name of Lady Day. So right. that was either. But uh, I, I think she has said that she sort of, um, her style of singing is formed after your uh, style on tenor sax. Well, I think you can hear that on some of the old records, you know. Sometimes I'd sit down and listen to myself and it sound like two of the same voices, you know, something like that. Here's a 1938 cut from Billie Holiday with a full chorus solo from Lester. This is basically Count Basie's band, but with Teddy Wilson on piano. I don't know what the Count was doing that day. The bird with feathers of blue is waiting for you back in your backyard. You see your castles in Spain. Your window pane back in your own backyard. Oh, you can go to the east, go to the west, but someday you'll come weary at heart back where you started from. You'll find your happiness lies right under your eyes. While they were in Los Angeles with Count Basie in 1944, Lester and drummer Joe Jones were served a draft notice for the military. White jazz musicians were likely to be placed in military bands led by prominent band leaders like Glenn Miller, but Lester was placed in the regular army stationed in Alabama, where he was subject to racist treatment and he was unable to play music. He drank heavily, which got him into trouble, and he was eventually court-martialed for possession of marijuana. He was sentenced to a year in the military prison called the Detention Barracks before receiving a dishonorable discharge in late 1945. After his release, he wrote a tune called D.B. Blues about this traumatic time in his life. Lester's experiences in the Army left him permanently scarred and precipitated a long downward spiral. 
He had some good playing experiences over the next 14 years, including tours with Norman Grant's Jazz at the Philharmonic and performances with Basie, notably a 1957 appearance at the Newport Jazz Festival. But he continued to drink heavily, although he avoided heroin, which was a scourge in the jazz community, and he became increasingly frail. His last performances were in 1959 on a European tour during which he reputedly barely ate. He died hours after returning to New York. Billie Holiday, who was also in bad shape at the time, said while she was en route to the funeral, I'll be next. Four months later, she was gone too. Along with Sidney Bechet, Lester Young and Billie Holiday were two more jazz giants who died in 1959, a year that's been described as the single most important year in jazz. Of the musicians who appeared in the 1958 Great Day in Harlem photo, Lester was the first to pass. For a lot of the musicians in this photo, it was probably the last time they saw him. You can always tell a picture of Lester by his off-kilter head and saxophone position. There are different theories about how he developed that, whether it helped him hear the horn better or was the result of sitting sideways on a crowded bandstand. In any case, it caused him to stand out, and it became part of Lester's legacy as a quirky and somewhat mysterious character in jazz. Lester was an iconoclast who invented his own vocabulary, some of which remains in the lexicon today. He referred to money as bread, and when asking how much a gig paid, he said, how does the bread smell? If he asked you, does Madame burn, he wanted to know if your wife cooked. He had big eyes for something he desired. If he played a bad show, he got bruised. To play a song straight was to play it vanilla. I feel a draft was reference to racial prejudice, and to my mind, it's an antecedent to the idea that a derogatory statement is described as cold. He called his saxophone baby doll, and the bridge of a tune was George Washington, which is perhaps the most esoteric expression of the bunch. Coming from a time when every man wore a hat, Lester favored the pork pie, which was called that because it resembled an upside-down pork pie. Charles Mingus's tune, Goodbye Pork Pie Hat, was a tribute to Lester. Here we see a magazine or newspaper article in which, quote, jazz sophisticate Lester Young shows how he fashions slick style popular with hepcats. The captions at the bottom read, hat is first rolled halfway down. This is called busting down by Lester. Evenness of fold is examined carefully. Black is Young's favorite color. He says, I got eyes for it. Young uses fingers deftly to achieve the right effect. He calls this phrase bringing the lid back home. Finished product is proudly displayed. Young wears his flatter than most pork pies. This 10-minute film called Jam in the Blues was made in 1944, produced by Norman Grant and photographer John Milley. This would be Lester shortly before he was drafted into the Army. The film was nominated for an Academy Award, and it features some multi-image effects that look a little cheesy now, but were advanced at the time. This clip is from a Norman Grant series called Improvisation, which was something of a sequel to Jam in the Blues. It showcased different musicians in various sequences, and some of the only footage we have of Charlie Parker came from the same series. The musicians are either trying to lip sync, or some of the out of sync bits are quite hilarious, like Buddy Rich slating the take without his mouth moving. One, two, three, four. This last clip is from 1958, so Lester would have been about in his last year of life. He's playing one of his favorite songs, Mean to Me, on a TV show called Jazz Party, hosted by radio personality Art Ford. This was early days for TV, and this show showcased jazz musicians from across the musical spectrum in a jam session format. Willie the Lion Smith is on piano in this one, and Charlie Shaver's on trumpet. Lester is clearly in a diminished physical state, but he plays with determination. At one point, he asks the drummer for a little more ticky boom, which I assume means energy. Come 